I'm going to go through the sort of basic stuff in sailing from, from scratch, going out on the race course. Uh, and it would be really nice of you to just pop in with a few questions or suggestions along the way, because it's such a broad subject and uh, it's a lot to cover and I'm sure I'm going to miss some stuff. Um, the stuff I was looking to go through today is preparation before you go out on a racetrack, what you need to think about. Most of the time, if you do good preparation, many of you are straight into sailing, if you forget about the preparation, um, it's good. You, you can really hurt the, the rest of the day. Uh, we're going to go through it before the start, what you need to do, uh, to go through the checklist, and then how to win, which I call it. Uh, that's the sort of this, 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 go see you. I can't see that, it's not quite a <laughs> <laughs> and that's sort of the, the last one, sort of the key elements to uh, be really fast and uh, successful out on the track. So, if you just play along in a scenario on a race day, say uh, uh, any good uh, Saturday down at the Yacht Club, what I do when I go sailing, I, I sort of plan it from when the start gun goes, and then what I need to do before then. It's pretty much like anything else in life, uh, but it's just makes everything a lot more easier. So if I want to have the start at 11 o'clock, I need 15 minutes to check the start line. I need uh, probably 30 minutes to sail the first beat. I need a couple of minutes to, to get myself ready in the boat. Uh, and then I really go down into detail. So I really have a time when I leave the dock, because then that means that I can muck about on the, on the dock before I go sailing, so I can hang out with my friends and all that. But if I set a time, uh, that's when I leave the dock and that's when the boat should be ready. Uh, if you sail a laser, that's quite easy, you can control everything yourself. But if you sail a big boat, say 10, 15, 20 people on the boat, uh, you need to make sure that everyone is on the same page. So if you send out this, this schedule, so the day before, uh, everyone knows what to do. <coughs> you can see my schedule goes all the way down to sort of leave my apartment to, uh, to make sure that you get a copy of this. Uh, you can look at this. Yeah, yeah. I think it's on the uh, website. Yeah, we'll, we'll take a PDF and we'll also get the video on the, on the website as well. <coughs> yeah. yeah, so no need to take notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, crew walls on a boat. This is the sports boat, the long tee. But on any type of boat, it's pretty much the same crew walls. Uh, if you sail you know, a double handed dinghy, you basically got the bowman and he's doing a lot more work. Uh, towards the back, and then you've got a helmsman who's doing, uh, well, they might share the helm the, as a tactician, but then you got, and the main, uh, so the, the helm might do the main as well, but then the bowman might do all the other jobs. If you go on a bigger boat, let's say Frank Pong's boat, he's got perhaps 20 people on the boat, and it's all the same tasks, it's just they need a little bit more manpower. In Hong Kong, I suppose most classes here, we sail four, uh, four people in the boat. And you can see on this particular boat you've got the bowman, the trimmer, the main trimmer, and the helmsman. And the reason why we need to specify all these roles is that when you step on board on the boat, if you do the bow, you should control the bow. If you do the trimming, you should con control the trimming. What I mean by that is, as soon as you come down to the boat in the morning, if you're the bowman, you should make sure that you know, all the halyards run clear, uh, all the sheets are, are clear, uh, the, the spinnaker is packed the way you want, and then going back to the trimmer, he needs to have his sheets ready, he needs to make sure you know everything is in his area, it's good to go. So at the time you get to the race course, everyone knows you, you can go sailing straight away. Uh, I think an important thing in Hong Kong is that perhaps the owner is also the helmsman, he brings on a lot of new people, and maybe not everyone knows what to do. I think it's very important for uh, the helmsman to go around and, and, and show new areas, help out, because you really need everyone to be on the same page. You can't, it's not going to help when you start racing to sort of give uh, loud guidelines to people in front of you how to do it. It's better to just go through it uh, before you get out there. <clears throat> When you, uh, when you get down as well, it's important to you, you check the forecast. <coughs> you need to know, of course, if it's a windward or a windward race or if it's an island race. 
this is to set up the boat uh, with the rig settings and what sails to bring. So if it's a, if it's a light wind day, you're doing windward lures. Maybe uh, if you're on a on a big boat, maybe you do need to bring the Echo Zero or, or whatever you have the the heavy sails. You want to keep the boat really light. Uh, and vice versa, if it's very uh, heavy wind, of course you need to have uh, all the thick, uh, heavy cloth in the sails. Um, but it's also not only sails, you know, you need to set up the rig. Uh, usually I, I look at either light conditions, medium conditions, or heavy conditions, and then you sort of have your rig setting. I'm not going to go into to too much of the rig setting, because uh, you can speak about that a whole night. Uh, but most of you that sail class racing, you can check with the, if you, if you haven't figured out your sail settings yourself, the rig settings yourself, you can talk to the sail maker or you know, browse the web and find all that. Um, but really, when you get down to the boat, the first thing you should do is set up the boat. Now clearly this can, can change during the day, and that's why we've got the forecast there as well. So if you know it's going to be light in the morning, you might pick up in the afternoon. Uh, sometime during the day, you need to sort of uh, make sure you don't have the light wind configuration. You need to maybe find a happy medium where you're happy in both light and, and heavy. As I said before, uh, please flick in with questions all the time. If, uh, if, if I miss something or if you've you got any good advice of what to think about when you get down to the dark, for instance. <coughs> so, I might have included a tide in the previous one where you said check the forecast. Yeah. I think especially in the harbor, it would always be a good thing to check the tide. Yeah, especially because sometimes it might take you a really long time to actually get to the start line mm -hmm. if the tide's going to be against you. Yeah, oh, that's really good. Uh, it's, it's a good point. And not only get to the start line, it also may affect where you want to sort of warm up, as I put on this list here. Um, I'll get to that in a few seconds, I suppose. Uh, but leaving the dock, when you leave the dock, you really just want to make sure the boat goes into race mode straight away. So. As you kick off, dock lines down, fenders down, and you know all sails up, jib up, main up, and go sailing straight away. There's nothing more frustrating than you know some people are ready to go racing and some people are still trying to figure stuff out. Uh, of course, you know we go out and have a good laugh on a Saturday. Uh, we want to have a good chat and, and all that. But if you can get the boat ready first, then you've got plenty of time for that later. Um, This is my sort of checklist before the start. As I, I put on the schedule before, you need to have a good 45 minutes an hour before you actually get racing. You always need to have a bit of a warm up. A warm up could be a couple of tacks, a couple of jibes. Get the feel for the boat, you know? Get back in, where, where did I leave it last weekend? You want to get into the same groove. Sometimes you want to pop up the spinnaker before you, you start, uh, especially if you have uh, new people that are maybe not sailed that boat before, you want to you know, make sure everyone knows what to do. And all that takes a lot of time, especially the bigger boat you got, it tends to take a lot uh, more time for the maneuvers. You want to be able to check the boat speed. Uh, it's really, really crucial to get up to speed straight away. On a smaller boat, like uh, like what we do here, class racing, maybe you want to line up next to someone else to check it check it out. Uh, if you don't have the speed, you need to adjust your sail. You maybe need to adjust the rig. But it's really crucial you got the boat speed. If you don't have the boat speed, everything else is a lot more difficult. You need to give time. If you're a helmsman, you need to give the trimmers time to do adjustments. On a big boat, on, a, on a, one of the big boats here, you've got the speed dials, so you can easily see if you're, you're up to speed with your old numbers. Remember what you did uh, in previous conditions, same conditions. Um, but always make sure the boat feels good before you do anything else. Normally on a windward lured, you sort of go straight to the start line, and from there, you start working your way up. Because you want to, even when you test sail, you test sail for speed, you want to sort of stay within your start area or sort of the racing area. Uh, this is also to get a feel for wind shift and so on. But if you're in the harbor, it could, uh, it could be occasions where the tide is so strong and the wind is so light. So if the, if the tide is going out and the tide is going with the wind, perhaps you risk too much being sailing above the line. 
Uh, I remember just a year ago where we were only 50 meters from the line and the five minute gun goes and we just couldn't make it. <laughs> we wasted the kite, we couldn't get back, the wind just died. But if we instead just, you know, started uh, below the line, uh, did our tacks and did our speed training below the line, then you can always easily drift up with the tide. Uh, you, don't, you don't want to fight the tide. <clears throat> um, when you when you got the speed, you want to do a couple of uh, you, you want to try this the race course. So in the harbor, maybe you want to try the left hand side and see what the wind is doing there. Uh, if you sail here, if you sail in the harbor every weekend, you usually know how the wind sort of pans out. But sometimes, well, quite often actually, it's a specific angle where one side is better than the other. So sometimes you want to try that out before the start. You can just go at five, five to ten minutes on one tack and, and feel that out. Even more so when we're out in, in Lama, uh, a lot of you might be out there doing championships this autumn, uh, and you really need to test the racetrack. You really need to get sort of how the wind shifts are going, uh, probably time them, clock them, see how often they change, see what happens when you go to the right hand side. The, is the wind lifting or uh, heading? And the same thing on the on the other side. And, uh, you, uh, how uh, consistent is that? <coughs> what you do during the week? Um, you know what? You can have a whole day with everything changing all the time. You can't really figure it out. But most of the time, if you do race, the first upwind. People can go different ways and no one really knows. But when it comes to the second beat, 90% uh, of all the boats are going to go the same way. Because then everyone figure out where to go. So your task is to do that first beat before the start. So you sort of get an idea of where you want to go. And uh, hopefully no one else figures that out. So <laughs> you have an upper hand. I think, I think those of you that are training for championships over at Lama as well, uh, so the 515s and naturals, might be a good idea to start. As, as Baki was saying, when you're looking at the, the wind shifts and, uh, and what was happening around the course, make sure that you write it down in the waterproof notebook so that then you can refer back to that um, you know, in, after that. So you can, if you then get faced with the same conditions, you can look back at your notebook and see what worked or didn't work. Um, and also note down rig settings, if they were good or bad. Um, and then you start to build up a little black book of things that work or don't work. And then by the time you get to the championship, hopefully you've built up a bit of a, um, you know, quite a, a good base of, of knowledge there to work from. So that's well worth doing. Yeah, I always, really always find that, you know, sailing the first beat, or sailing the beat before the start, you know, you know, to the question that was asked about whether it's going to be like that when you actually do it, I mean, I know. Right? And, when I, we always find that when it comes to picking how we want to start, if we haven't sailed the first beat, our decision-making process about where we would like to start on the line, and whether we want to be going fast or whether we want to be going high, is, is very much uninformed if we haven't sailed the beat first. Whereas if you sail the beat first, you've got an idea of which has been a better side, and that helps uh, bring a lot more clarity to the starting decision, which is, of course, about the biggest decision you make in the entire race. You can set the boat up as well, because they might be different depending on the waves. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But then you got, you know, I was sailing on the same race, race course every single weekend, and you think you, you, you know what's going to happen. But by just doing that little upwind beat before the, before the start, you might get that little vibe from, oh, this is exactly how it was you know, three weekends ago, and you're like, yeah, and you start to remember, well, it was really favorite on the right-hand side, or, you know, the boat's going almost in there, getting the most, or, or what's up. The other thing I think works really well is if you're sailing on the first, first beat before the start, if you can find out what is a high heading on starboard, i.e. a lift on starboard, and you can figure out what a, a, a header is on starboard, well, that's also good. But while you're lifted, go head to wind, and actually see what that true wind direction is on the compass while you're sitting head to wind. So if, if a high number is, say, 220, 180, let's say, on starboard, that equates to a particular number, 230 or something, on starboard, like head to wind. So when you get back to the start line, you can go head to wind at any time before the start, and you know whether the wind is generally phased to the, to the right or to the left. 
so you'll know wh which side is going to be lifted off the start line. It makes a hell of a difference to, to choosing the end of the start line with two minutes to go. You can just go head to wind and you know 2.30 is a right hand shift because you went head to wind on a big lift on starboard. Gives you a really good bearing of the, the line and the course relative to the wind. Not a lot of people have the head to wind number, the true wind direction number, and that's a pretty useful thing to have. Peter, what do you think about doing split tacks before the start? You, um, you mean with a different boat? So with a, with a training partner? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I find it's... Uh, I find it very you useful. You don't trust any of us. <laughs> <laughs> Who could you trust? Yeah. <laughs> what class do you say? <laughs> <laughs> it's very much true. I mean, uh, I think everyone does that in uh, growing up in the like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But, yeah, as Jamie said, I'm not, I'm not sure you can do that without... I mean, if you go... If, if we would go to a world championship in Europe, yeah. and say, uh, me and Jamie would go yeah. together, we'd be sparring partners. Yeah. Perhaps it would be a good idea because it's a new place and yeah. we can both learn a lot from it and it yeah. wouldn't affect our result. In the, That's the thing where you don't want someone else to benefit but and also you're going to benefit yourself so it's a bit of a... Yeah, I mean, it, too, out here, sure, if you haven't been in Lama for... Uh, you've been in a hot roll season and you're going to Lama and you're two good friends and uh, sort of want to do better with it than a third, <laughs> why not? Um, might, maybe I should show what that means. Yeah. <coughs> So basically what, what Nick is saying, if this is the race course, uh, I, always, I always do the race course so the wind is coming from above, like that. So if this is the race course, what you can do is you can do the two extremes. You have one boat going this way, and the other boat is going that way, and you both sail for about five or ten minutes, depending how long the race course is, and then you both, you've both got five minutes, and after five minutes you both attack, and then you can see uh, the one who's coming up in front, uh, if both get the sort of similar speed, that will sort of suggest that this yeah. course side, side of the course is fake. Now, of course, uh, if you're really into that, you wouldn't do like this. You would stop when you're here, so no one down here can see. It. So yeah, as soon as, soon as it becomes <laughs> obvious, then just stop. Yeah. You know that this one is going to cross, yeah. but from down here, you can't see it until they actually cross. So you want to keep that all secret. <laughs> Oh, good thinking, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> hadn't thought of that one. Uh, what else? We're on, we're on two, right? Yeah. Um, the third one is super important, uh, of course. And if you have, uh, if you're not sailing by yourself, it's always nice to, to talk to someone else. If you're only two in the boat, let's make sure both of you know what course you're doing. If you're uh, but with ten people, at least two or three should know what course you're doing. Because uh, trust me, I, mean, I was watching the, the Bold Ocean import race in Brazil, I think it was, where the first boat goes around the wrong mark. <laughs> so it happens to all levels, but it's pretty embarrassing uh, when it happens. So by knowing the, by knowing the race course and confirming which one it is, it's, it's a good thing. I think it's you, Ross, that told me once that uh, the, the pilot thing, right? You always confirm two pilots what you're doing. And then you sort of eliminate all the mistakes, which is quite good to do in the sailing. You've got to come up with an independent solution to the yeah. Yeah. Uh, But of course, as you figure out what course you are doing, everyone should know on the crew. Everyone should know if you're doing windward lures, two laps, or if you're doing a triangle, because everyone needs to know how they can prepare. Uh, after you figure that one out, it needs to sort of put all the information together that you, you figure out. Uh, you, you establish that the left-hand side was favored, so you really want to push to the left-hand side. You want to sort of move towards the left-hand side of the start and, and go left. Uh, and everyone should know that as well on the boat. You might, you know, there's all sorts of things, but you need to have a strategy in place before you start. Things can change, but most of the time I find out that if you change <coughs> things along the way, you're better off just sticking to your original plan. It's better to have a, a plan than no plan in trying to figure stuff out on the way. <clears throat> and then last, uh, what I do before the start is, is check the start line. You need to have plenty of time to, to do that. And um, this is sort of a, just a little uh, diagram of how to, to check it. We say the race committee is here, the pin is here, 
uh, if it's a really long start line, you well, any, any length of line, but it's really difficult to know if you're in the middle of the line. So you, you definitely need to check it and get a transit from either this end or the other end. And how you do that, how I usually do it, I usually just line up either outside the race community boat, and I look at the flag here, and just follow in, and if you're lucky, there's a green flag there. <laughs> but <laughs> most of the time, it's a construction site or a, a building or something like that. Um, if there's nothing out there, you can also take one from this side. Maybe you've got land on the other side. So you preferably you have two ways, but you should definitely try and get the pin and one. And this is, uh, especially on a big boat, you need to have the bowman check that as well. Because uh, he gets, he, he can stand up on the bow at the start time and actually see the line. You see a lot more there. If you're uh, all the way at the back, it's a bit more trickier because clearly if you if you look at here, if you're on the line, then the rest of the boat is in front. Uh, you also need to check the lay lines. So you need to come down here and sail fully sheeted on. And when you sort of just make the, the, the mark, that's your uh, transit for the lay line. Most of the time, land, if land is really far away, that transit is the same on, on the race committee and the pin end. So you can be lucky and just uh, need to do one. But if, if it's in this situation where land is pretty close, you need to get a new one, and you get a new transit here. And why you do this is because when you line up, if you want to start by the pin end, if there's one minute to go, and you're here, and you see that you're under the lay line, then you definitely need to bail out straight away. There's no time to save you, you just got to get out of there, because you're never going to make it. Even if this, in this position, if it's one minute to go, He's going to struggle to just sit there for a minute without drifting sideways. Uh, same thing on the race committee. You can't be outside the race committee when it's less than one minute to go because you're never going to get any room there. So you need to, if, if you come in and tack sort of one, one and a half minute before the start, you shouldn't be further out than the, the near transit. Um, what else is good to know? You, you can sail the line when it's a long line. You need to know how, how, how long it takes from this side to that side. If it takes a minute, it's always helpful to sort of, uh, when you put your boat into to the strategy you want. Um, if you got tied, like you have in the harbor here, that clearly changed a lot. So, for instance, if you sit here for when it's a minute to go, you got tied with you, then you know you're going to be inside the lay line, because if you just sit still, you're just going to drift this way. If you got tied with you, that means you can sort of, uh, you don't need to go as close to the line at the start, uh, before the start. You can sort of sit back a little bit because you know you're going to get there with pace in it. Uh, and clearly the opposite, if you've got tied going against you, then you really need to be close to the line because otherwise you're never going to make it. You can even, if it's a lot of tide, if it's one and a half knots of tide, you can probably sit here, you know, one boat length from the line when it's, 20 seconds to go and just sit and wait and until you absolutely need to accelerate so 15 seconds before the start. If you're further down, you're never going to make it and you're sort of controlling your fleet by being ahead of everyone else. <clears throat> All right, so that's sort of, that was sort of the preparations before the start. Um, is that you? Is that me? Is that <laughs> it's real. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah. This is my mental photo when I go racing. Um, if I want a good day, this is the photo I think of. But you're over. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's you, right? We, we nailed the pin end. And the Australian was over the line. So that's good. How about Japan? Japan over the line too? Uh, I think uh, Australia was the only one. Oh. The photo is actually bigger, there's more boats behind <laughs> um, No, I, I like the photo because when I go out and I sort of see myself in that position before the start, then I know sort of what to do to get into that position again. Uh, I mean, it's sort of the next level, I suppose, to visualize what to do, but it's always good to have a nice moment before you get in there. Um, so how to win? There's, I'm sure there's several things, but these are the main things that I think uh, everyone should think about to, uh, to be able to do a good result. And the number one is speed. 
it's, it's so important with speed. Any type of boat you sail, speed is absolutely crucial. Uh, one design, fleet racing as we do here, is uh, probably even more so. If you get 50 boats off the line, everyone's sort of almost the same pace. If you're just a little bit faster, that controls the whole game. If you're a little bit slower, it's not as fun. <laughs> if you're a little bit slower, you would never be able to do the strategy you want to do. You're always going to struggle because there's going to be boats in the way. So speed, speed, speed. Uh, this is not only for the helmsman to think of, this is the whole crew. Everyone needs to think about speed. I think also if you get a bad tactic, obviously if you've got good boat speed, it's much easier to recover from a bad tactic. Um, and um, so that's another reason why it's so, so important. Always important. Always important. Uh, second one, if you're, you're sailing a bigger boat than a, a laser, uh, crew work is obviously very important. Um, uh, sailing's got the bad habit of uh, sometimes putting too much thought into the helmsman and tactician. Whereas if you sail with a really good team, every role on the boat is important. Not because, uh, you know, if, you, if you're doing mast on a big boat, you're pulling a piece of string. But that's not all you do. You can do heaps more things. You can make sure that the boat is balanced. You can make sure the crew is at the right place. You can call the winds. There's always tasks for everyone on board. So crew work uh, is super important. Uh, and you need, to, you need to let everyone else decide within their area. You need to let the bowman decide what's going to happen on the bow. You need to uh, let the pitman decide what's going to happen in the pit. And the helm, on, on a good boat, the helm is just driving. It's doing nothing but driving. Make sure the boat is up to speed all the time. Which sort of comes back to the first one. But the third one is, uh, is clearly important, strategy. Um, but it's very difficult if you don't do the first two correct. <coughs> so speed. Um, a few things to just... I'll, I'll just go through them all. I put down high performance boat and classic boat uh, because a lot of things are happening out there now and uh, it sort of changes sailing. If you're having, if you're sailing, by classic boat I sort of mean like an etchel or a dragon. It's a, a long, uh, thin boat with a long keel, uh, fairly small sails to, to uh, not much power in it. Uh, a high performance boat I would look more like the sports boat. It is usually the balance between the keel and the sails. So if I, I do a high performance boat, usually got a big square main up here, a way too much horsepower, and then a, a very, very slim keel, and all the way down here, a big bowl. And these are, are quite tricky boats to sail, uh, because you can change the speed so much more. Uh, sort of a, in between classic and, and uh, high performance boat would be, I suppose, a J80 uh, would sort of fit into that range, where you still got a fairly wide keel and uh, not too big sails. Well, the kite might be a bit big, but <laughs> upwind. <clears throat> and the reason is uh, I've seen a, a couple of examples out there this summer where, uh, you know, it's a high performance boat and the crew and the helm is not talking at all. Uh, sailing in the light stuff might be quite easy because you just sheet on the sails and go. But as soon as you get overpowered, this boat is just going to tip over and it's just going to drift sideways. The high performance boat, you always need to have speed forward because to get the lift from the keel, because it's so thin, you need to have a, a good flow around the keel. Uh, if you have a long keel like this, it's not, you know, it's not that important. Um, it's less of a fine tune if you sail higher or low, uh, fast or slow, on, on the classic boat. Um, so what you should think about if you sail a, a high performance boat, or, or a J80, is if the wind kicks in, and uh, you keep the main sheeted uh, same as usual, the boat's just going to heel over, the helm is going to try and get the speed going, he's going to pull the tiller towards him, and it's just going to get worse and you're going to start to drift sideways. Uh, what you need to discuss between the, the helm and the main trimmer is you need to, to ease the main a little bit to get uh, the boat a little bit flatter so the boat moves forward rather than sideways. Uh, 
if it's really windy, say 20 knots or, or above, then it's not only the, the main trimmer, it's also the jib trimmer. I'm sure you've seen uh, a lot of boats out when it's windy. You can see the boat is healing over plenty. Uh, the main is just flogging, and you've got all the pressure in the jib. <clears throat> so the jib trimmer sits here. He's looking at his jib and he's really happy because it looks, <laughs> looks beautiful. He looks back at the mainsail and it look, looks horrible. And uh, clearly the boat's not going forward very fast. So because you only have the pressure on the jib, the, the jib's going to push the bow down, the helm is going to uh, push the tiller away, so he's going to come up again, and it's just going to start drifting. So you need to have a balance on both the jib and the mainsail. So all the pressure is sort of on the keel, and there's no pressure on the rudder. And any questions around this? Because it's, it's, it's a bit technical. <clears throat> and please feel free to click in. And um, yeah, so sometimes when you, when you go out, people think sort of the main is the throttle, which it is. But to throttle on, to, to sheet on, it's not always going to make you go faster. Sometimes you really need to ease out to get the speed going before you can start cheating up. Uh, so how much should you cheat on? When it's, well, light wind is fairly easy. You just want to get the perfect trim. We're getting sort of a little bit into the trim now, but I'm just going to touch on it a little bit. Uh, so light wind, it, you can just uh, you sort of cheat on until you see the sails look really pretty. And then you get the medium wind, the boat starts to heel over, and then all of a sudden you get more than medium, you get sort of heavy wind, and the boat is just heeling over even more. So what's this, how should you trim it? As, as a helmsman, I usually find it that there's an optimal heel angle on the boat. Um, I think that's sort of when we come into the feeling. Uh, each boat's got a different angle. Uh, as soon as you pass this angle, the boat is going to go slow, you're going to start drifting sideways, and you, you, you're just never going to go as fast as anyone else. If you just start easing the sails a little bit at that stage, the boat is going to go a little bit flatter, and you're going to start moving forward. Uh, if it goes too flat, of course you need to sheet on again. And I think, that's, uh, I think that's the best indication of trim from sort of you know, 8 knots and above. You sort of just always work the balance, and that's especially on high performance boats. Uh, Dragon and Etchel, I suppose you can push them a little bit harder because you're not going to, it's fairly small mainsails and you're not going to push it over the edge too much. And it's not, it's a, a lot longer keel, which is not going to make you drift sideways as much. But still, you always need to discuss with the crew members, are we, are we sailing as fast as everyone else, you know, how we're doing, are we faster, slower, higher, lower, and constantly talk about speed, all the time. I, th I mean, I think that's a really interesting point, Pete, because certainly if you come out of dinghies, <clears throat> or if you've done the training course in dinghies, all you ever get told is to sail the boat flat, right? And then you start sailing in something like an Impala or a J80 or something, and all of a sudden you have to sail the boat heeled, because if you let the mainsail out or the jib out until the boat comes upright, it doesn't work. And I, I've, I've found that that's been a, a difficult thing to explain. But that finding the heel angle that the guys that are seem to be sailing well, and then trying to copy that, you know, has always been a, a I found a very helpful, you know, guide, you know, in the spirit of back to basics, you know, whenever we're finding that we've got a tough groove. I mean, even the first day, I don't know, it's Lawrence who's gone, but in the first day of Cow's Week this year, we went slow, and basically the only way we got back to speed was by copying the fast guy's heel angle and it, and it does it really does work that's a good point look around what what, what are other people doing how are, how's our boat looking compared to everyone else's it's very easy to sail a, a one design fleet because you know <laughs> then it's especially see it you just look at the fastest boat in the fleet and just do whatever he does usually works <laughs> well apart from the fact that it's really depressing that it's obvious that you're crap <laughs> <laughs> you know handicap racing is much better that way I think, I think as you said, Peter, with the, with the crew work, um, especially as trimmers, you've got to communicate. And you've, um, as a helm, 
you shouldn't be having to feel too much on the rudder at all. Um, just a slight bit of weather helm, so it should be wanting to slightly head up to wind, just a little bit all the time. If you feel that you're having to push too much or pull too much all the time, then your trimmers definitely need to do something about it. So, uh, as Peter said, you've, you've got to try and restore that balance. So you either need to depower something or power something up, um, and yeah, you need to find that balance point. And uh, and it's all through communication. A lot of it's all communication. Maybe I push a little bit too much emphasis on, on the medium to heavier area stuff now, but it's, it's equally important in the light stuff. Although. Uh, on, on bigger, heavier boat, you usually have to <coughs> think about other things. You really need to start thinking about where you put your, put the crew. Uh, you can put the crew. You can put the crew forward. You can put the crew backward. You can put the crew down to leeward or to windward. And it's it's really up to. You, you need to have one crew dedicated to sort of move everyone as a unit. You can't just all running around a little bit what you think is best. Is uh, usually like the massman is great for that because he's not doing a lot on upwind, so he can easily just see. You know, you can you, you can look at, at the bow knuckle here, this corner here. You can look at that one. Is it actually sticking down in the water, or is it actually pointing above the water? Same as behind the boat here. Most boats are designed so that it's, it's just going to be really smooth behind the boat. Uh, Jade is a good example. Is if you sit too far back. You're going to get so much turbulence behind the boat. Actually, I'm sure you've noticed on all the modern boats, like the, we got the big MC38, uh, the 38 footer with, with a massive stern. And that one is sort of designed to do very well reaching and, and sailing downwind and sort of skip through the water. But comes light wind and uh, upwind, you really need to move the crew away a lot. You need to move everyone forward because you don't want to have that big stern in the water. And that's that's extreme, but it really helps to, to on, on most boats. Etchel, I don't know. I never figured it out because it looks it's a bow on both ends, but <laughs> <laughs> so Peter, where does it where does the fly fifteen fit in this gradient from high performance? Well yeah, I mean you can fly fifteen look at the boat hole, it sort of looks like a you got the flat stern, so it's not like a dragon on etchel. Uh, so it comes light wind. I'm sure you need to move a little bit forward as well. Uh, and the same as you know, when the wind picks up and you're going downwind, you really need to move further aft, right? Uh, it's a fairly uh, small main and it's a fairly big keel, so perhaps uh, you don't need to play the mainsail as much as a, a, a big square top, but you still need to work it. Uh, I actually never sailed a flying fifteen, but I can sort of compare it to the Magic, I suppose. Magic's got a big keel, a big bulb under here. And I tried to figure out what's the fastest. I tried to heel the boat over in, in big air to sort of get the keel to help uh, the writing moment of the boat. And that never worked. So I ended up sailing the Magic almost flat, which means that the keel is not going to help at all. It's just going to be drag and slow. But the boat is just so much faster sailing flat, and I suspect that the Flying 15 is similar. You're not going to get too much help. I mean, clearly, if you if the boat heels 90 degrees, you're going to get the keel to help out a lot. But it's just not going to be very. Sails don't go too well through the water. No. Boom is low, isn't it? But you, you know, when it comes to you know angles and stuff, if if you don't know your boat very well, you really need to push the you know the ridiculous limits. If you're if you're uh, if you're new on a plateau, the club boat out here, you don't know where to sit. Well, try to move everyone really far forward. Sail for a minute, you know, get the feeling for it, and then you move everyone two three meters further back, and try that, and then sort of you know move back and forth until you sort of find where oh this is this is pretty good. You know, if you get on a new boat and you just start moving inches. It's very hard to find a good spot straight away. So moving extreme is quite good. <clears throat> Just moving along, going down the going down the list, correct sails. I suppose it's not really um, important if you if you sail the class racing here. The the etchel's got a couple of different jibs they can choose from. Um, some classes got different spinnakers they can choose from. 
clearly this is more for bigger boats where you can have you know, four or five different jibs and four, four different spinnakers. Um, but you need to make sure you've got the right sails. If you're going away for a world championship, for instance, uh, you need to figure out what conditions you've got there before you, before you go. Uh, Hong Kong is pretty particular with light winds and no waves. So if you're going to Australia or somewhere, where it's big waves and big wind, perhaps you need to think about sails before you go. Uh, correct trim, of course, super important. I'm not going to go into trimming today, but point being is that when you get out before the start and you start trimming, um, you're going to have one guy on the jib fine tuning, one guy on the main fine tuning, and they need to ask the helmsman or they need to talk to the helmsman all the time. On a bigger boat, you might even have uh, uh, someone else. Well, you can have the main trimmer or your tactician just calling out speed all the time to make sure you're doing 100% speed all the time. If you're not doing 100%, if you, go, if you come off the start line, this boat is faster than you, you need to do something. <laughs> if you know you can be as fast as the other boat, you can't just sit and wait for him to just pass you. You know, you start talking to the helmsman, uh, how does it feel? He might say, well, a bit overpowered, you know, just ease the sheets a little bit, try and push for, for speed. Uh, if he needs more height, clearly you need to either put the pull the traveler up on the mainsail a little bit, or if you got inhalers on the jib, try and squeeze them in a little bit. So always keep on talking. A big mistake that I find all the time when I sail with people is that jib and main trimmer don't communicate. So you can have, you know, one guy trimming. You know, the jib looks it looks great, but he's sort of trimming for height where the main guy is sort of trimmed for speed, so you know, you've got a completely different setup. And it's just going to be slow. Even on, when I sail a double-handed boat, you know, when I was helming, I was trying to go high, my crew was just trying to go for speed. You know, if you don't talk about it, it's not going to work out. So, you know, looking at a boat from above, what I'm saying is here, if the trimmer trims on the jib a lot, and the mainsail is sort of out here, you know, you're just going to get disturbed air. The boat wants to go that way because you've got more power in the jib than the main. Uh, so these three roles, the, the helmsman, the main trimmer, and the jib trimmer, need to communicate all the time. And that's why, you know, sometimes it's tricky because you need to do the tactics as well. <laughs> but always talking is, is a good thing. As soon as it goes quiet, that's usually quite slow. So what are they supposed to what's it supposed to look like? Bad Sorry. Alright, so this is bow, this is the mast, this is the force day going up to the mast, and this is the jib, you should see it on here, and this is the main main boom, and sort of the corner of the back of the boat. Does that make so sense? So how do they look if you're trimming for height or, or speed? How do they look differently? Uh, how should they look? Yeah. How, how should they, they look? look? I mean it, it, it's all depending on what boat you're on. Um, I, I think the general rule is sort of, you know, you want to have them fairly similar set up. So, you know, if you got a tight main, you want a tight jib. If you want to have a, a little bit faster boat, you, you ease the mainsail a little bit, the mainsail goes out here, you need to ease the jib as well. So I suppose if they're perfectly trimmed, both of them, as soon as you ease one of them, you should ease the other one. Because they should work as one unit. Now, sometimes you need to, you know, if you need to hike on the boat, you can't trim the jib as much as you can on the main because it's got a winch down to, to lures. So you just got to take the hit and leave that one at a sort of good average number and then you play the main. But if it's light wind, for instance, the jib trimmer should always sit down here, trim it all the time. <coughs> what sort of boat do you sail? Sorry, the, the question that was asked. Uh, roughing? Okay, because I mean, the, one of the biggest things that's going to be making the decision about how you trim it is going to be whether you've got an overlapping headsail or not. So on a roughing, you've got an overlapping headsail. Mm -hmm. So basically, the decision about how hard you've got it on is whether or not you're sticking the spreader through the sail, right? Yeah. That's pretty much it. Yeah. So if you wind the rough, roughing Genoa on until it's touching the rigging and the spreader is starting to get close to the sail, that should be pretty hard trim. Mm -hmm. 
and therefore the main boom should probably be on the center line and the main sheet should be on pretty hard as well. Um, and if that's for high mode, and if you want to go fast, then you'd be easing the Genoa out a bit, so it's a couple of inches, maybe six, nine inches away from the rigging. Um, but I think the main boom pretty much always stays on the center line on a ruffian because the main's pretty small relative to the Hensel. On a J80 or an Etchells or a, any other boat with a blade, I think our general rule would be the hard trim would be that the leech of the jib is parallel to the mast. Um, so anything outside of parallel to the mast is starting to ease trim, and so you'd be easing the main at the same time. I'm sorry, what do you mean by the blade? Sorry, if the jib doesn't come back behind the shrouds, oh. if it's just a little jib up the front, then looking from behind, if it's parallel with the mast, that's about hard trim. I was going to try and draw it, but I don't think I'm going to succeed. I'll, I'll do it again. <laughs> If you go back to looking at the butt from the side, this mass. So you've got the force to here, and overlapping, and then you've got the main coming down here. And overlapping Genoa goes probably down here, whereas uh, on, on Etch or. Well, Dragon's got overlapping as well. Etch yeah. or J, J usually goes down here. Yeah. So it's quite a big difference in size compared to you know, the, the, the head sail and the main sail are quite different. The main saloon, the ruffian, is sort of along for the ride. <laughs> you know, it's the Genoa trim is the real key. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter what boat you're on, the basics, as we're talking about today, are all the same. Uh, it doesn't matter if you sell a dinghy or, or you know, an America's Cup boat, it's, it's the same kind of thinking of how to set up the sails to go fast. It's sometimes worth getting somebody on board just once, twice. And then they can help you get set up. And when, once you've got that set up, then you, just, you can just repeat yeah. it. Then you know that's what a good point. Is, you know what a low mode is. You know what the normal mode yeah. is. That's a good point. Uh, I know Jamie usually pushes quite hard for this, and uh, I do it for match racing. Is to mark all the ropes. Um, where sort of if you, if you find a normal setting on the jib, the Genoa, you just put a little tape or a little mark on the on the sheet. So you know when you sheet it onto the winch or the block, that's sort of your, your normal mode. And then you want to go into fast mode. You ease it maybe that much. Doesn't need to be much. But just crack it off a little bit and then you're in fast mode. And you're on, if you're on the other side of the boat, you can just take a look down and you can easily see it. Um, I do that all the time on the mattress because you don't have time to, to trim. <laughs> it's just you're in fast mode. mode, aren't you always on the you know, fast mode to get speed? <laughs> Quite often, yeah. <laughs> but sometimes you, you, you know, even the even the match race, you tack a lot and do a lot of maneuvers. Speed is so important. It's probably yeah, more important yeah, than anything else. A little bit off the mm -hmm. so, so high. Anyway, we're not supposed to go into too much details on trimming. Okay. But that's fine. <coughs> uh, what else we got? Um, yeah. Well, I was talking about. High, high mode, normal mode, and fast mode, and I think this is uh, super important. And it's just uh, everyone should just talk about it on the boat. It's it's when you sail with other boats around you, especially coming off the start line. Um, you know, you come off, you got a couple of boats sort of above you and slightly behind you, and you just want to squeeze them off. So the higher you can go, the better it is because they're they're not going to be able to survive there. So you just tell everyone in the crew, we're going to high mode, you sheet on that jib a little bit extra, you sheet on the main a little bit extra, pull the traveler up a little bit, and you know the speed is going to drop a little bit, but this is just for a short moment, and you just go high. If you don't say high mode, you know people are just going to trim like usual, and you're going to push the boat higher, but you're not going to get the power off the sails. Same as if you go into fast mode, you've got someone that is almost running over you, it's going to catch your wind, you really need to get off the line. So you just crack off the sheet a little bit, ease the jib, ease the main, and just bear away. And that could, you know, you can do that for a couple of seconds maybe, 30 seconds, and then you go back to normal mode. Um, fast mode should sort of be as, the same as when you go out of attack. If you attack, you sort of leave the sheets a little bit east to get the boat up to speed. If you're on a bigger boat, it's good to have someone that counts down, you know, you're doing sort of six, six and a half knots, seven, you're up to speed. And then when you're up to speed, you should have the normal trim. 
but so you only ever use sort of the higher fast modes for sh very short periods of time. Uh, it could be when we're out in the harbor. You know, we want to go close to the one of the harbor sides. So instead of going normal mode, we want to just hold on because there's a lot of tide. So instead of doing a lot of tags, it was just going high mode. If you go on the ley line, you realize you're above the ley line. It's just an easy call, fast mode, because we're over the ley line, and everyone knows what to do. Uh, it's it's more to get everyone in the same mindset than anything else. And never stop working on speed. That's that's the key. Uh, you know, sometimes people work a lot on it after the start, and then sort of forgets about it. But you need to do 100% all the time. <coughs> Um, moving on to crew work, I think uh, we learned a lot by just doing double-handed. You know, two. I, I used to sail in a single-handed dinghy, which is very easy. You just communicate with yourself. You actually do that after a while when you get a bit nuts. <laughs> uh, but then you step into a double-handed boat and start talking to other people. And if you just sail along, you know, both know what to do. Both know the roles on the boat. And you can do it, but to be uh, to, 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 to just gain that extra speed, you need to talk all the time what you're doing, what the next move is. And the bigger boat you get, the more important it is to talk. As I said, you can start from before the even before the start. Everyone knows what track is going to sail and what the strategy is. It's really important for for the bowman and uh, and the massman to know what you're going to do. Uh, so they can know how they're going to set up the spinnaker and, and which side and so on. Uh, thinking one step ahead, I find it's super crucial, especially if you do, you know, sit out here, you've got sort of two minute tacks and it's very windy, you need to hike. And it shouldn't come as a surprise as the next maneuver you're going to do is you're going to tack. Uh, sometimes you hear, well, you, you could have given us a bit more time to let us know that you're going to tack. But if you sail upwind, you're gonna attack. <laughs> you shouldn't come as a surprise. So even if you sit relaxed and you know on the side and hiking, you should be up and running in a couple of seconds, even though you're in a good conversation about something. Um, same thing. Get involved. You know, uh, it's lovely to go out racing on a Saturday afternoon, and it should be lovely. But you still need to be involved in what you're doing. You should still be. You know, if you're in the middle. If you're a six boat crew and you're sitting in the middle, you shouldn't let the guys in the back uh, decide everything. You should give them uh, feedback about, you know, you line up next to another boat, you can tell them, oh, we're a little bit higher, a little bit slower, just constantly feeding them with information. You can look at, you know, it could be easy stuff like, have you, have you guys seen that barge coming in through the harbor? Because most of the time, no one's seen it. And uh, it could be, <coughs> looks like a wind shift or a gust coming down and of course you need to put those roles uh, to certain people because it would be quite stupid if, if six people shout it's, it's a gust coming in but if someone looks for barges, someone looks for wind gusts, <coughs> someone looks, you know, there's heaps of stuff to look at uh, so everyone sort of needs to be involved um, I, I know you Oscar, you go, if we're doing upwind uh, with, with a big boat we come closer to the mark, he needs to know what, what spinnaker is going to set up. So of course he needs to pop the question back to the guys uh, taking the decision. You know, are we going to just bear away with the spinnaker? Or are we going to do a jive set? Or, or, you know, what's going to happen? Everyone needs to know what's going to happen. And if you don't know, ask. What are you thinking? <clears throat> and it's, I find if I'm helming, and, you know, it's sort of tricky conditions, someone asks me, what are you thinking? You actually need to think about it. <laughs> Otherwise, it's easy to just sit along and you know, sort of get into your mode and you sort of forget the big picture. But if you get the question, then you need to start discussing it. And um, of course, the crew is not stronger than the weakest link. So if there's a new guy on board, help him out. Teach him. Don't take his rope. Don't push him away. Teach him. Get him up to speed. If you're helming, you have a trimmer that's never been on the boat before, drive the boat a little bit slower, let everyone know. Yeah. Give them time. 
um, I mean, classic. It's all the big boats out here in Hong Kong, because there's so many new people to all the boats. So they come down to to the bottom mark, and Jim might disagree, but 70 percent of the time the kite is not down, and that's clearly, you know, it's not one's fault. It's just that the whole team itself hasn't planned ahead and, and got the timing right to get everything working. And that's, you know, the crew is not stronger than the weakest link. If, if you just drop a little bit earlier, the kite's going to be down and you can do a good round. <coughs> How about, I was thinking about this one, how about even helmsman? And by helmsman, I'm, I mainly mean that if you go out on a Saturday, uh, you know, you've got a new guy on board, it's not that comfortable packing a kite, give the helm to someone else and you can go forward and help him out. Uh, even if you're a helmsman, you're not, you don't need to be at the helm all the time. You can do other things. <laughs> That's completely true, absolutely. I endorse that completely. Any questions so far? There was a crew that had a that had a sh oh, their team shirts on the back of it. They had printed. Are you ready? With a big question mark. But this was a, like a, a semi-pro team, just simply for that very first point that you you put up there. Because basically, you're sort of sitting there, and it's you know you're halfway down the run. It's like you know whatever. And then you'd see on somebody's shirt, you see, are you ready? With like, oh shit, what are we doing at the bottom mark? And you know, forced you to think about it and get ready. It was, it was quite cool actually. My naked. Um, so that was the, those were the first two, uh, speed and crew work. Uh, the last one is strategy. It's not that important. <laughs> if you got speed, you don't need to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, of course it's important. I mean, strategy, again, you can talk about this for ages. Um, these are a couple of things that you need to look out for. Before the start, during the race, always when you go sailing, um, wind shifts is, is clearly important. Uh, if you're on the open ocean, there's still going to be wind shifts. It sort of amazes you when you go sailing out to you sail Hong Kong to San Fernando and you still get a wind shifts 200 miles out. Um, perhaps those are quite difficult to predict, but if you're in the harbor, for instance, usually you know the wind shifts, you can time the wind shifts. Um, the more you sail in it, the more uh, you get used to it and you can, you can time it yourself. And tide and current is clearly important, especially if you sail in the harbor, but even on a llama it's got a, a quite a big importance. Clouds, you can sort of forget in the harbor, unless there's something really big coming in. Um, but if you sail in Saikun, for instance, Shelter Cove, it's really important. If you see a big cloud moving in, you, you know that the wind is going to shift. Uh, some people, you know, they, they look inside the boat, look in the race course, but they forget to look on the clouds. Why does that happen? Why does the clouds come in or why does the wind shift through the cloud? Uh, the, okay, I'm not going to try and make a fool out of myself here, but basically, basically you know, the clouds are building up, so they're sucking air in. When the, a, a big cloud comes, I mean, there's many, many different clouds. But most of the time in Hong Kong, you see uh, thunderclouds. That's the big one coming in the summertime. And in the thunderclouds, there's usually quite a lot of wind pressure in it, or actually getting pushed in front of it. So if a cloud, if this is a cloud, look in front of a bug, and this is the race course. If the cloud moves down through the race course, you know it's going to sort of push wind. You can, you can push wind out on the sides here, out on the sides here, and push wind in front of them. And sometimes you can use that wind shift to sort of sail. You know, if you come from here and out to this side of the cloud, you can go higher. And you need to you, you need to see if there's a cloud coming in. Usually when a cloud's come in, there's more wind in it. You don't want to go through the cloud because underneath the cloud is most often not any, any wind pressure at all. So if you can sneak around at the edge of the cloud, most of the time, that's, that's quite beneficial. <coughs> but even, you know, it, as I said, the thundercloud in Hong Kong, maybe you need to prepare for that. 
maybe you need to change to a smaller sail because you know it's going to be so much pressure. And you don't want to be taken by surprise by it. So you want to be prepared. <coughs> In the harbor, the, uh, the, the clouds obviously don't work, but the birds do. So when you see the birds circling around, don't sail under them. Because that thermal going. Because it's just the thermal going straight up in the air. There's no wind underneath them ever. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's only the case for the next couple of months, and then March, April, May. But it's stone cold. Good. Didn't know that. Yeah. Another good uh, thing, looking at wind in, in the harbor. I mean, it's cheap on you. That's the trap. <laughs> so it's, it's funny how. You know, the best sailors out there sort of forgets the easiest way to predict wind. Especially sail in the harbor. There's so many different ways you can find out the wind. There's usually heaps of flags all over the harbor, on buildings, on boats, on, well, you probably shouldn't look at a boat that's moving, but boats that are parked, anchored, and you can look at the flags here. Uh, smoke, there's plenty of that in Hong Kong. Uh, you can, you can actually see, smoke is very good because it sort of piles up like this. So you can sort of see what angle it's got. So you can even see the wind shift on the smoke. Uh, so there's several different ways of trying to find out the, the wind. Uh, I'm thinking of llama. There's not, there's not a particular way you can find the, the wind on flags because it's quite far away. But you can usually see on the water it's a little bit darker. And llama is particular because you get you get like winds from the sides. So if you can see a darker patch moving in on the side, that means that that gust is prevailing for the next couple of minutes. So you might want to face that one. And sometimes it moves to the other side. And this is very, very difficult. But point being, if you look outside the boat, if you try and figure out, you know, where can I find the next wind? Where is the, the next wind going to be beneficial? Uh, land formation is super important in Hong Kong. Uh, it's actually, I think I actually got this. I'm going to see if you show this to you. Um, this is, uh, do you guys recognize this? It's the Lama channel here. This is Lama. Uh, this is Stanley here. If you go out from in Lama, go sailing, all you see if you look at Hong Kong Island is. is just a big island, but you know these days when you got Google Earth, it's quite interesting because you can see the formation here. You can see the mountains, and most of the, quite often we sail sort of within this area, the sort of what is this northeasterly wind. And just by looking at this map, you can see if the wind is moving across the mountains. Here's a lot of mountains blocked, so the wind is probably not going to go. There's probably not going to be a lot of wind here behind the mountains. You might drop down a little bit further up. Stanley is just a small, small ridge. So you're probably going to get wind coming through here. And then you've got a fairly big mountain here where you can get wind going around here. And this is, is basically what you see when you're out sailing out here. That sometimes you can get wind coming from, from the left hand side coming in through here or even from these gaps. And sometimes you're going to get the wind coming around here. So depending on where they put the racetrack, uh, it, it makes a big difference um, which side you can choose. Can look at the harbor as well. So depending on, you know, the worst time ever to sail in the harbor is when we got this sort of northerly, right? Because you never know where the wind is going to come from. But if you look at the chart, you can see that this is actually the shortest distance from land. So it's fairly likely it's going to get some wind coming through here. It's fairly likely it can go in between here, down, down here. And uh, you, you just learn a lot from look, looking at the map, especially if you sail in the area you've never been before. You know, the sort of easterly we get here through the, chan uh, through the harbor, you can see how this sort of funnels through here, uh, depending on what what wind uh, direction you got further up, that's sort of how it's going to pan out in through the harbor. Uh, Saikung is even better, I think. <clears throat> I think you, 
we got the same sort of classic wind direction uh, when we sail sort of out here. Uh, I suppose it's, it's a bit more northerly when we sail here. And sometimes when they put the upwind mark on the left hand side, you really need to go left because you get the, that wind coming through here. Uh, I usually call this Frank Tong's corner because it always goes here. But sometimes they do really well, sometimes it doesn't do well. But if the mark is further this way, then you just need to get out and get the wind coming from up here. Uh, so by just looking at the, the surroundings, um, it's really, really useful. I know, I know we talked about checking the forecast, checking the tide and stuff before we go out sailing. But sometimes it's quite fun to go out without checking anything. You can check the clouds. Out in Hong Kong, it's very easy to check the tide. You can see it, you look on the land, if it's high tide or low tide, just look at how, how high the water is. You look at the ferries, what, um, the anchored ferries, the mortar ferries, what angle they got, if they're pointing inwards or outwards, and then you can see if the tide is going in or out. So you can always play with all that and try and figure it out yourself. But clearly, if, you, if you've got tools like Google Earth and stuff like that, it's certainly helpful to uh, to look before you go. <clears throat> yeah, in the harbor, I mean, we have funny things like prohibited zones, ferries, and barges. And you need to take those things into consideration as well. You know, if you start and there's a barge coming through the fleet, quite often you need to choose side before the barge reaches you. So you need to have one guy helping out. The letting you know if there's a barge coming in or a ferry coming in or things like that. <coughs> Any other questions on, on strategy? I mean, the, I'm trying to keep it fairly basic, but you can, I'm sure we can talk about this all night if we want to. One more thing I actually got, which is uh, mark roundings. I thought it was quite important. Um, Mark roundings is, is a place, well, going around the marks is a place where you can gain a lot. It's, it's just very, very easy to gain a couple of boats. Um, I found this photo today, which is it's quite interesting. You can see these are uh, four seven-days going girls, actually, going up wind. And these guys are coming in a ley line. You just see so many boats that overstood the ley lines, just going to come reaching in. And they're just going to lose so much crucial uh, space. <coughs> so if you go on, uh, look at the upwind. <coughs> this is particularly important if it's uh, a lot of tide or if it's a lot of wind shift. <coughs> this is the upwind mark again. Wind coming down from above. You've got the ley lines coming out like this. There's heaps of different tactics to this, but if you go upwind, if you go straight from the start out to the ley line out here, you, you absolutely nail the ley line. Well, if it's going to lift, if the wind is going to go further right, you're going to be above the ley line. So then you're going to lose all this distance compared to other boats coming in, tacking underneath you. <coughs> if you're going to get a header, well, then you're all the way out here, you don't really want to get a header as you're all the way out here because you're going to lose to everyone else that's going to get a lift from the other side. So if you really want to go all the way to the right and you're way off the mark, you've got a long way to go, you should definitely just tack inside the mark, inside the ley line, because if it's going to lift, you're going to make it, and if it's going to uh, head you, then there's probably going to be boats behind you that are going to get ahead as well and you're going to be in front of them. So always keep Give yourself a bit of room there. And same goes, exactly the same goes for the other side. Now, if we sail in a big fleet, <coughs> a bit like this photo here, and you're sort of, you did a pretty bad start, you're trying to get up through the fleet, quite often you're going to see, maybe I should just draw, there's going to be you know, heaps of boats here. The ley line is going to be up here. Quite often, if you, if you know you're not in the first 10 boats, you can tack early and come in, sort of, you, you need to come in as a three boat and so on. But come in and try and tack underneath people. Otherwise, if you're going to start lining up here, 
this distance to the ley line could be you know anything from 10 meters to 50, 100 almost in, in big fleets. Uh, so there's a lot you can position your boat to gain you know, small small places through the fleet. I think what's important is if you're leading, it's all about covering the rest of the fleet. But if you're further down the fleet, it's all about gaining small steps at a time. Let everyone else do mistakes. The biggest mistake people do is they're trying to win everything back at once. And uh, you might have a lucky day, but it could equally go the other way around, so you're going to be even further back. So by just thinking you know, smart, trying to go through the fleet two, three boats at a time, um, you know, eventually you're going to be up top ten, and it's going to be so much easier to sail. Coming around the mark, clearly you want to go as close to the mark as possible. But after after the mark rounding, you get the choice. Um, maybe I should do this more spinnaker way. If you got a spinnaker, you got a choice of going really uh, deep. You can go a little bit higher, or you can jump. And you need to take that decision before you before you even get to the three boat links on. Now, what what should it choose? Well, it depends on uh, if it's land here, tide going tide going against you. Maybe you want to get in <coughs> towards the shoreline. It could be that you've got a couple of boats in front of you, and you want to get the higher course. You want to get in there as quickly as possible. Then, when these guys put the spinnaker up, so now you definitely just want to be above them. Cover the wind and eventually they might even jive out. Now if, if it's like out here, quite often you want to go into the other side because you've got the highway here, especially if you go to Shaka 1, then you want to jive straight away. Everyone should know before you get to the mark we're going to jive and set. So you come around the mark, force the kite at the same time, you just do a slow maneuver and go into this side. If you are leading, quite often the better precision would be, especially if you sail with an asymmetrical spinnaker where you've got a bit more angles, you want to be a little bit further down because you've got the apparent wind angle so you're not going to get the wind straight from behind, it's sort of going to be up here. So you want to be in front but you want to be able to jive. If this guy comes down below you, that means you can't jive and you're forced to continue, you sort of lose your options. Um, so you really want to have a mindset before you even reach the top mark where you want to go. If it's a lot of boats going around the mark at the same time, you can you can gain a lot of boats at the same time. And the cross people are going to get dirty air and you can just easily sail them. Downwind mark is uh, a lot easier and a lot more exciting and you can gain a lot more boats. That top mark situation that you talk about there, the Taiku Shing boy in the harbour is a screaming example of that. When you when you come up, you know, both the first bit about overstanding it and how you can make a gain by coming up on the left and nipping in there so you don't overstand. And secondly, the bit about the jive set, when you beat up into the tide to get to Taiku Shing, very often you see guys coming around and doing a bear away set and sailing in towards Kai Tech for about you know a couple of hundred yards before they jive back out. Whereas the, the tide, of course, is so much stronger outside in the middle. So the little just coming around and jiving immediately, especially on the boats that normally go to Taiku Shing, the Ruffians, the Impalas, the 15s, because they generally sail pretty close to straight downwind. They're not heating it up like a J80 or a, or a Magic, for example. So you might as well just come around, do your job, and stay in the tide. Coming down wind, normally it's just a, a normal a port rounding around the mark. Go around like this. Uh, this. This is so basic, but so many people forget about it. You need to know how fast your boat is turning. If you have a dinghy, it might turn a lot quicker than if you have a heavy keelboat. If you have a heavy keelboat, you can't enter next to the mark like that and exit like that. You're going to stop the boat. Can everyone see you, by the way? 
If you've got birds outside you, you still don't need to be next to the mark. You've got marker. You can be a good half a boat length between the mark and yourself and get around and just sneak close and get really tight exit. The exit is absolutely crucial. Where you can really gain is if you've got Quite often you got several boats coming into the mark at the same time. If you're this boat, realize early that you're not going to get a good rounding. You know, when you're sort of six to ten boat lengths out, when you when you get close to the mark, you, you know that everyone here is going to have mark room. So what you should do, you know, sort of drop the spinnaker early, come behind everyone, sort of reach in. I mean, you're still almost away from the mark, but reach in and, and sort of line up next, sort of behind the next fellow here. <laughs> if you're even lucky, there's so many boats. This guy is going to even be outside the three bell on the zone. So when you get down here, you know, if we all go around, if he's so far out, you're just going to try and push everyone around here. You can just sneak in and get a good rounding. And you gain probably three boats at least on this round. It, I mean, it happens every weekend. But the exit is absolutely crucial. It doesn't matter if you're you know, first to the mark. If you're fifth to the mark and get a good exit, you're still going to lead after the next step. <clears throat> Another good thing, if you, if you know it's going to be tight, if you're a couple of boats here, say you're, you're sort of midway down to the mark, you got another two minutes to go here, but you know, as this boat, it's unlikely going to cross in front and not give these guys mark room. So, you know, give up early. Go behind people, come a, come a little bit higher, and try to put yourself in this position. You know, you, you, you're going to end up there, back there anyway, if you get into the mark. So you might as well get there early. If you're lucky, you can get good speed, you can get mark room. Always try and aim to, to come in as the inner boat to the mark. Um, especially here, you're starboard as well, so if you're outside the Three belt lengths on your starboard, you can just push everyone out. But always try and plan your mark roundings to get a good exit. I think that's about it in mark. Anyone got any questions? You can do the gate as well, which even prove, proves it even worse. How important it is to get to get the inner boat at the mark round. If we got four boats coming in here, sometimes we got ten boats coming in here, you got a tight gate. I can tell you what, being the boat in here is, is not very good. If you come, come you, you got marker on everyone. You just go around the mark, and in the middle here, you, there's actually no rules for this, because he doesn't have any rights at all. He's got to give room to these guys, he's got to give room to that guy. He's just got to slow down and sort of wait for everything to happen. So this, this situation, you just want to avoid that as early as possible. You can see this from you know two minutes out. If you come into a gate and you're up here, you're in the middle there, do something about it. Slow down a little bit, go on this side, or go on that side. Of course, if it's a gate, you, 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 wanna, you know already where you want to go. So if it's slightly favored here, or if, if you want to go left on the, on the beat, then you're better off just you know, go behind these two. At least you're going to get a good rounding on this one. These guys are going to get pushed out to the right, so you know, you're probably going to gain at least two boats. <clears throat> and you know, drop the kite early, get everything nice and tidy before you go to the mark. This, you're going to lose a lot by sailing past the mark rather than dropping two seconds early and go 0.1 or not slower. You're not going to lose that much from going a little bit slower. You're going to lose a lot from not having a, a you know, main and jib sheeted on and everything nice and clean again. Uh, I think that's about it, actually. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Or anyone have uh, anything they want to talk more about? Any suggestions? Or... I suppose your first example there, I think, is yeah. where the green boat went round with everyone, yeah. and there was a blue boat down here on the outside. On the down? On the down, yeah. Um, couldn't have you get in there if you were within the three boat lanes, so you could go and get on the Sorry, it's coming out of that. Yeah. And do this, but. Well, you, 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 you peeled the green one away, didn't you? Oh, if you go behind. Yeah. And yeah. then when you got down here, yeah. you had three or four all rounding parallel, I guess. Yeah. And Something like that. Yeah. And then as they went round, you then brought the other boat in. I mean, you've you got to be, you be, you be careful from this boat because if this guy is still within three boats on his own, uh, when you enter, there's no overlap. You don't have any rights. Yeah. But if you just take it really nice and, and easy, yeah. you know, if it's four boats, no you're going to be heaps of space. <laughs> but don't worry, because <laughs> you know they're gonna, they're going to end up sort of in this situation. So as long as there's an overlap, unless he really slows down and try and go behind these guys as well, then you're just going to do another slow down and be behind him. But even if he does a good rounding, you're still going to get these two. That didn't make it good. So, Peter, e even if you slip inside him, um, and maybe it's a bit questionable whether it's two or three boat lengths, or maybe even a little bit more, you, but you're not sure. But you've slipped inside him, and it's caused no impact to him at all. Can, he, there's no problem. See you then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he can he can scream and shout at you as much as he wants, but if he's too far away to do anything, then he just has no room, and you can just go heaps room. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Unless. You know, there's contact, or he's actually going to have to avoid you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, you don't have any rights. Yeah. Uh, a good thing to think about coming around like this is, you know, in the harbor, is it tied against us or is it tied with us? If it's tied against us, mm, probably be a bit more careful because even if you're out here, you might actually start drifting up towards the mark and it might close the gap unexpectedly. But if it's tied with you, definitely go for the gap because there's going to be one. <laughs> Let's show you this light wind. Go for it. What's the worst thing for that? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, coming down as well, if you want to slow down a little bit, obviously you have to drop your spinnaker a little bit earlier. To slow down the boat, you know, if, if you plan it early, you can sort of sheet on the main a little bit. You don't want to slow down too much though. What I find easier is just try and steer a little bit back and forth to sail a greater distance and still keep the same pace on the boat. <laughs> Even even you might want to come out here a little bit if, if these guys are in front of you. So you can come in with a hot angle, come in with full speed, rather than being sort of dead downwind. It's difficult to accelerate. Always, always trying to you know, be able to get up to speed as quickly as possible. Any other questions about anything in general? No? Right? No about that. <laughs> <laughs> Is that you? Do you know how it happened? No, it's not <laughs> I just found the photo. I thought it was quite funny. Um, Peter, thank you very much for uh, for coming in and doing that great talk. Thanks. Fantastic. Um, this this talk will be going up on the website uh, when Richard's back from uh, Botanic to leave, and. Um, We've got a talk on racing in Llama on the 8th of October. And is it you, Jamie, or is it someone else? I'm, I'm unsure. I'm unaware of it. We've got, some, <laughs> we've got a Llama expert coming in to talk about the Llama race course, and, uh, and that's on the 8th, same time, 7 o'clock, so please come along if you can. Uh, if you're doing 15s or actuals, then probably well worth coming to. Great, thanks. Is that a Monday?